Oh, thanks very much for that kind introduction. And I want to thank uh, the IMS and also NUS and the Singapore Mathematical Society for inviting me to give this lecture. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a, a workshop happening uh, this month up at the Institute for the Mathematical Sciences in, in my particular branch of mathematical logic. And uh, it's quite an exciting experience. You know, it's, and I can't overestimate how important these sorts of institutions are. There's a, there's a similar, we have in the United States a similar institute, the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, which I am lucky enough to have it affiliated to my own university. And, well, first, IMS, if you say IMS, sounds a lot better than what you get if you say MSRI. So congratulations on, on a nice choice of acronym. But also congratulations on, on sort of stepping up to, to provide uh, a focal point for the development of science in, in Asia. The MSRI has, I think, a, a, an extremely important role in, in the development of mathematics in the United States, and I think the IMS is going to do the same here. So good luck with that. Okay, what I want to talk about today is, is uh, I'm going to start out very generally, and I'm going to move slowly to uh, things that are more detailed and more focused and, in some sense, more technical. So what I want to start out talking about is uh, something that we do every day as we sort of function, try to function in life and make decisions and do whatever it is that we're trying to do. All right, so we all, to some sense or another, like, if you, if you don't know what to do, you try to figure it out. Right? You try to um, think intelligently and c clearly with the optimism that you know, if you have some problem, especially if, if it's a concrete practical problem, not an emotional problem or a romantic problem, but a concrete problem, how am I going to uh, get to the IMS today because the C bus is not running? Right, so you think about it and you figure, well, you think about all the options, walking is not an option, and you think about all the options and finally you make a plan and sure enough, eventually you get there. Right? You, you sort of use, use reason and, and uh, you know, with, there's some optimism behind that, right, that if you think about it and you don't panic, right, you'll eventually find a solution and get to where you want to go. Okay, so that's a, a sort of... Sometimes you know you have to have inspiration, right? You have to have the, you have to have a flash of insight, which which tell you know sort of the, then you can do it, right? You can get the key in the door if you turn it the other way around. You know, so but it's usually you can figure it out. You don't just walk around blindly bumping into walls, hoping it's the IMS. You know, it's, right? There's some some you know aspect of thinking about things and making a plan and then getting there. Okay, so that's that's what I want to talk about. Right, but I'm, and I'm going to move to the mathematical realm quickly, but not right away. So the first, the first thing is, you know, we all, the first, especially if you're a mathematician and you have some problem that you want to solve, you tend to, I do anyway, try to think rationally about it. Right? That's my first thing. If, if things aren't working out, I think, well, let's get rational. Let's think about it. Right? That doesn't, it's not always the case that, um, well, wh why? Why do I think that? You know, why do I think that if I, if I think clearly and I reason about it, that I'm going to come to some conclusion? It's not always the case that the means that you have at hand are sufficient to get you to the conclusion that you want to achieve. Right? It's, nobody would try to drive their car to the moon. Right? You, you want to go to the moon, you don't get in your car and drive around until you run out of gas. Right? It's, you, know, you can't get there in your car. Yet, um, we tend to think that if we think about things clearly, we can figure out the answer, especially if it's a concrete problem. Right? If it's not an intuitive problem, if it's some concrete matter of fact, well, we can discern what, what is, what's the fact of the matter. Right? Now, okay, so it's, you can't drive your car to the moon. Right? So that's sort of a... a uh, you know, whimsical idea. But there are other 
cases in mathematics where if you restrict the means at hand in a certain way, then it's impossible to accomplish the task that's set. And there's this, you know, the most famous one that I can think of is this classical, uh, the limitations on what you can do with ruler and compass, right? So if you have ruler and compass, there is these, you can, if you, if you draw a perpendicular line to a given line segment, you can bisect an angle. And then there were these, there were various classical problems that were set, you know, by the Greeks that, that uh, if you can bisect the angle, can you trisect the angle? Right? And then there was, a, there was a beautiful proof to show that no, there's, if you limit yourself to what you can just do with ruler and compass, there's a task that cannot be accomplished. You can't, can't, can't do various sorts of geometric constructions using only ruler and compass. Okay, but then, so if, if uh, you take the right course, you sit and take the right algebra course and you study hard, you'll know why that's the case. Right, so a certain kind of mathematical construction is impossible with those particular tools. Now, that doesn't mean everybody believes that those things are impossible. It's, it, it's, so I'm, the, I'm currently you know, the chair of the math department, and there's a lot of mail that comes through the department office that's directed you know, to the chair, right? which, I ha which I now have to open. Right? And every month or so, I get a proof right, that you, can, you actually can trisect an angle with, with ruler and compass. Right? And there's, there's a sort of sense, in the, I think I understand what's going on in the psychology there. Like, it's, it's not a matter of, it, there's an unacceptance, you, there's the reluctance to accept the fact that something mathematical is impossible. Right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's a reluctance to accept the fact that it's actually not possible to do it as compared to nobody has thought of how to do it. Right? So it's, and I, I even had people come to my office, I can do it. I can trisect the angle. And the, most of the time I send them to talk to a colleague in algebra. But uh, <laughs> so I actually have, to, have talked to, to a couple of these guys and they are absolutely convinced they can do it. It's, even though you, know, you try to, to explain why, you know, the reason, you know, the proof. That there's, no proof is enough to show somebody that it's not possible with hard work to figure out how to do it. Right? Like, my father keeps bugging me to figure out how to win the lottery. He's, he's convinced there's a formula right, to figure it out. Right? And he's like, why don't you work on something important? Stop talking about this abstract stuff. And I try to tell him, it's random, Dad. There's, there's no formula that predicts random. It, you're just not working on it, Ted. It's okay. you're, you're thinking negative thoughts. You've got to like, get positive and, and get, get cracking on that problem. So, yeah, that was, that was what he decided I ought to do after I told him I wasn't going to be a doctor. <laughs> so, it's, um, so even my own father doesn't accept the fact that, that there are limits to rationality, right? That, that the rational process of trying to figure something out uh, is limited, that there's some things you just can't figure. All right, so, so I wanted to, what I want to talk about is the, the, uh, this aspect of, of uh, trying to use reason, and in particular, since this is about mathematics, trying to use mathematical proof or mathematical computation or mathematical techniques to go from uh, what you know to what you'd like to know. And, and especially, I'm especially interested in when is it the case that the principles that you have in hand that you could use to prove, to settle the question, or the, the computer that you're trying to use to calculate the answer, et cetera, the, 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 what you've got to work with. How, how is it that you can come to the conclusion that it's insufficient? Right? You, you just can't use those. It, those, that aspect of, of uh, proof and reason and rationality, it's just not enough. It's inadequate to get to the answer. Just can't, there are problems you cannot figure out uh, given, you know, well, I'll, I'll say more about this. I'll, get, I'll give some better examples. All right, so, so what we're going to talk about with that introduction is we're going to try to look at 
sort of the, the, ma the matter of mathematical proof and mathematical rationality and reason, how do mathematicians reason about things, and how good is that method? Is it perfect or is it limited? Right? And to what extent? And I think it's my personal, uh, of course, I'm a, I decided, you know, I voted with, with my feet. Right? My, it's my personal opinion, though, that, that the understanding of of uh, the mathematics, the mathematical analysis of, of uh, logic and the mathematical analysis of reason, that logic and reason are as one of the fundamental mathematical notions. And it's Im as important as notions of size or shape or, well, I had a couple more that I wrote down here, change. So it, size is, is measure and change is things that have to do with differential equations and shape has to do with topology or geometry, uh, symbolic manipulation and, and algebra. Well, the mathematics of logic and reason is just as important and mathematics has, has as much to say about that, uh, about that enterprise as it has to say about these, uh, these other things. So it's actually the study of logic using mathematics is really quite beautiful. All right, so let's get started. So I want to talk about uh, Logic and reason, right? Can we, can we figure things out by thinking about them? Okay, so the first, the first thing I want to talk about, so I'm going to start big and then uh, get more and more focused. So the first thing I want to I mention is that, uh, well, let me write down, this is, there's a famous example of Bertrand, this is meant to show you that things are not as, not as straightforward as they might seem at first. Yeah, this, unlike most math talks, I'm, I'm going to do a lot of talking and almost no writing. So this this will be sufficient for my entire the entire bit that I'm going to write through the whole talk. Um, it's easy to take notes. All right, so I want you to consider the following. This is called Russell's paradox. So here it is. It's also called the liar paradox. So I'm putting this one up so that you can see that as soon as you try to, as soon as you try to start, right, can we get to the truth by thinking? Right? Can we get, can, you know, is, is figuring it out always, what are the limits on, on reason? As soon as you even start, you end up with some nasty, some nasty things pop up right at you. Right, so how about this sentence? This is a particularly nasty one. So, and the reason that the thing that's nasty about it is, uh, well, is it true or false? I personally think it's true. <laughs> so, but if it is true, right, if I were right, Right? then it would be false. Right? So then I'm wrong. So, my, so, so if I'm wrong, right, it, it can't be true. Right? So it's got to be false. Okay. okay, so what's wrong there? Right? If it's false, it says it's false, so it's true. So what went wrong? Right? So something went wrong here. So which, which one of these four words don't we understand? This, I think that this, I use, that one I understand. I'm talking about this one, this sentence. And it's a sentence, right? It's got subject and a verb. Is, if I don't understand that, I don't I mean, I, you know, is is an is a existential uh, statement, but, which is also hard to explain, but I'm, that's not where the problem is <laughs> with this one. It's this one, false. The reason that this sentence is false is because we don't know what it means to be true. It's, it's, if you try to give a, a full account of truth, what does it mean to be true? Uh, you get caught up in these, in the, you end up sort of biting your own tail. Right? You get caught in these cycles of self-reference. That's what this is. So a sentence like this refers to itself. And so that's a, I'm going, to have a, I'm going to run through a few more and more precise examples of things like this, this nasty aspect of self-reference. 
So it's, it's immediately, as he's trying to think about what's true, you, and he's trying to do it sort of formally or, or logically, right? and he's trying to give a complete account of truth. Right? You run into this kind of uh, conundrum. Right? So Russell's paradox. Right? It's a paradox to trying to formulate, well, it's, not, it's, it's the liar paradox. Russell's paradox is a different thing. This is the liar paradox. It's, it's a paradox, you know, because if you try to formulate a complete and inclusive theory of truth, it has to be complete and inclusive and cover every assertion, and you end up in, in a circle, right? You can't define truth in terms of itself because, of these, because the self-reference can turn around and, and uh, invert itself. Okay, so, th so there's, there's some, some nasty business ahead, right, that we have to think about. Now, uh, so I'm not going to try to give a complete account of truth. Right? That's, it's already, you know, it's, it's already uh, all messed up anyhow. Because of, of this ability to have self-reference. But one thing that we could possibly do is, first of all, that sentence is written in natural language. Right? And I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm supposed to talk about math. Right? So that's not necessarily a mathematical sentence. Let's talk about concrete mathematical things, not about sen you know, sentences in natural language that refer to themselves and it's often some you know, obscure, dusty corner of, I mean, who, who ever read that in the paper? You know, that's, or whoever tried to prove that that was true you know, in, in uh, a calculus class? You know, it just doesn't come up. So let's, let's deal, I want to focus more on mathematical things, and then I'm going to try to get more concrete, the really concrete mathematical things. Okay, so somehow mathematical assertions seem to me like they're more tractable. Right? They should be, you know, it's, it's, mathematics is, is the one of the sciences where we have standards of rigor. We can recognize whether something is a proof or not a proof. Right? And when we say that, when we, when we argue some point or argue that, that something is true, right, we have, you know, we demonstrate it. Right? There's, at least in a lot of, a lot of pure math, uh, which is mostly what I'm talking about here, there's, you know, it's a proof or it's not a proof. Right? And it gets refereed, in the, and if the referee does a thorough job and the, the uh, author does a thorough job, it probably is true once it's published. Not always, but you know. But then somebody checks the proof and finds an error, and it all you know works out over time. So we have we have you know, we can sort of back up what we say in absolute terms. Okay, so maybe maybe we can uh, analyze not what's true but what's provable, right? Because that's a lot easier. Because something is true, it just happens that way. It's almost an accident of of uh, nature that it happened to be true. But if something is provable, that has to do with us. We proved it. Right? We gave a cogent analysis of the situation, right? which, which at every step along the way followed you know, rules of logic. And, and you know, from the premise, we got the consequence. And so we know that if the premise is true, the consequence is true. Okay, so that's, that has to do with what we, it's, truth has to do with What's out there, and proof has to do with what we can accomplish. Okay, so, how about the analysis of proof? It's no better. Right? This exact aspect of self-reference shows up when you try to analyze not only what's true, but when you try to analyze what's provable. And it was a, it's, a, it's amazing that you can take this, this simple four-word sentence Right, and prove that there's a beautiful theorem that was proven by Gödel, the sort of famous Gödel's incompleteness theorem, back in the 1930s. And so what Gödel uh, showed, and I'll let me write down a version of this sentence. So suppose you have a bun you have some mathematical principles, you know, the premise. The premise. So suppose. So that's my first. I don't have that much room here. So. You know that you know, I'm not going to write that much more. So suppose that T is some. And now I, I, I don't want to just take T to be all the truths, and then I could prove everything that's true, because I just say it's an axiom. So I want to say T is some collection of principles, or axioms, we can call it.
And I can tell in some very reasonable way, if I can write a computer program and run it under Windows XP. So suppose T is some collection of axioms that's computable, and then you can think of the following sentence. Okay, it's the same, same deal, right? It's, this sentence is false. Right? I replace, uh, by, if provable is an analog of true, right? it ought to be everything that's provable ought to be true, but, but uh, it had, not only is it true, it has a proof. Right? So now I'm replacing not true with not provable. Then what happens? Right? What, what happens when you just do this little trick? Can you prove this sentence? If you can prove it, then it's false. Right? So if T can prove this, if T can prove that this sentence is not provable, then it's got to be false. Right? Because it's, it's assert, it asserts it's not provable, but T could prove it. So if T is if T doesn't prove false sentences, there's a true sentence. And the method of proof falls short. Right? There is a true sentence. If either T is inconsistent or there's a true sentence that T can't prove. Right? So, so right away, this, this uh, simple uh, self-reference in, in language right, appears as, as a limit on what the method of proof can accomplish. And I'm sweeping um, uh, various things under the rug. T is in what language, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how, how strong is T? What is it? You know, and, and so on. But except for uh, you know, representing things in the right way and uh, laying out what you know, the reasonable laws of logic are, this sentence pops up as something that's either T is inconsistent or there is a limit on what you can prove from T. And then Gödel gave much, much nicer examples. The example, if, in a little stronger example, is if, if T is if T includes a little bit of number theory, not too much, basic properties of plus and times, then T can't even prove its own consistency. So not only can't it prove that you know, this particular aspect of self-reference is, he can't prove that aspect of self-reference, but in fact it can't even prove that it itself is consistent. All right, so it's, it's in turn, that's still kind of self-referential though, because T is talking about a property that T has. But it's a, an important property, right? If you're, if you're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to use these principles as I go about my work, right? you'd like to know that the principles that you're using are consistent. You're not going to head out to the IMS and end up at MSRI. You know, it's, it's, you'd like to know that what you're working with is not internally flawed. Right? And that's the very first thing that you can't prove using only what you know, you're willing to work with. So it's, it's uh, self-reference comes around and bites you even if you're just trying to give an account of, of provability. Right? If I have, if I'm allowing, if, if these are the things that I believe and I want to come to some conclusion, there's the first thing you can't conclude. Right? You can't come to a correct conclusion about whether what you believe is consistent. So provability has, has a problem with it. No, not a problem. It's just incomplete. You know, it's there's you can't drive to the moon and you can't use T to settle that sentence, because you can't get there from T. That's the that's the situation. It's just the same aspect of language. Language can ref, you can refer to yourself, and as soon as you can do that, you can say you know you can twist it all around and make it kind of um, you know impossible. Okay, now. So these are sort of these look like logical, logical uh, problems. You know, problems of syntax. Right? Now there's a there's a concrete mathematical problem which has been the focus of a, a large part of my own mathematical life. So I want to write down now the third thing. So I talked first about truth, and then I talked about what's provable, and I promised something about computation. So now I'm going to pull out 
what was people like me who work in this area of recursion theory, one of our favorite definitions. So now I want to pull out the following, and this is the last thing I'm going to write on the board, I think, which is the connection between provability and computability. So if you think about what, what's a proof? A proof is you start off and you know what the axioms are. Like if I'm doing a proof in, in proving the group identity is unique in a group, or I'm proving uh, some other thing like that, then I know what the, what the axioms are for a group. Right? And you, you do some, some short argument, you know, a bunch of sentences all in a row, and they follow each from, from the previous ones, and you end up with the group identity is unique. So proof is some finite, verifiable sequence of if-then, or you know, a calculation to figure things out, right? to figure out if this is true, that's true. Okay? But actually, it's cal calculations and proofs are, are more or less the same. In each case, when you do a calculation, you're sort of, you're doing a sequence of operations, right? Each one is, you know, you know, I add two numbers and then I use the result and, the, and I multiply that times the next number and so on and so forth. Right? So you're, you're getting a sort of, in a calculation of the sort I'm thinking of, you get a sequence of numbers or numerical states, right? And you go, you go from one to the next by simple operations. Right? It's a lot like doing a proof. Right? If you do a calculation, I want to figure out whether this polynomial on these arguments vanishes, and I plug in them, exponentiate, and multiply and add, if you do it all down on a piece of paper, you can check your work, and you get down to the bottom, and the answer is zero. Oh, these values are a root of that polynomial. Then I better check I didn't make a mistake, right? And you can go back and check each step of the calculation. But that's not much different than what you do when you do a mathematical proof. Right? You, you do some proof, and you say, oh, let's, let's see. If addition commutes, then the Riemann hypothesis is true. Then you say, oh, I better go back and check my work. You know, so, and you go through step by step, and you, you see if you got it right. right? So there's the, the, a proof and a computation have a lot in common. Each one is a finite sequence of steps. If each one follows, uses the results of the previous step and plugs into the next step. OK, so the, uh, the analog of the set of things that are provable is like the analog of the set of co computations that give answers. And so let me write that set down. So let's consider the following set. It's called the halting problem. I want to make sure I don't run out of time here. So the halting problem is the set of P, where, where P, <coughs> pardon me. So P is just a program writ written in C double plus, or or Lisp, or you know, ch choose your language and fix it, and then this is the, you can write down all the, the, it has some nice syntax, and you can write down all the sequences of, of uh, letters in that syntax, and you get a nice list of all the programs. So P is a program. And I want to look at the set of P such that P is a program in, in C double plus, and uh, P, if you run P, it eventually halts. If you, we get to start it, it gets to, to run, do its calculation, and it eventually halts. Okay, so that's what's called the halting problem. Now, I try to solve this problem. This problem has occupied, like I said, a lot of my, my time. And I actually tr try to solve this problem almost every day. Every time I look at that stupid hourglass on the computer screen, going up and down, up and down, right, then I think, is that, is the system hung, right? Is it ever going to, is it like, was it so hard what I asked it to do? All I want to check is my email. Right? But, and I get the hourglass, you know, it's going up and down, telling me, you know, please wait. And then I have to decide. Right? I have to decide, am I going to do Control-Alt-Delete right? and reboot because I think that program is never going to halt? Right? Or am I going to wait? Right? So I have to do a little calculation. Right? I have to try to figure the whole thing problem. 
right? And then I have to decide, right, whether I'm going to re reboot the machine. And it's even more annoying when control alt delete doesn't work and it's really hung. <laughs> then you have to decide, am I going to pull the battery? <laughs> but you know, so but you have to, so you have to make a decision. Right? And here's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that the uh, that set, the halting problem, right? which is a concrete set. You know, so there's a uh, you know, self, uh, you know, sort of uh, self-verifying computer programs, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's uh, it's a reasonable, reasonably concrete set. This set cannot be computed. So that confusion that you feel when you see the hourglass and you don't know what to do, you're right. <laughs> You're right, because there's no way to compute whether an arbitrary program is going to halt. It's, and it's the same proof, right? Because it's exactly the same phenomena, this one, this one, and that one. Because if you had a program which could evaluate the halting problem, right? then well, I, could, I could write a new program. Here's my, here's my tricky, nasty program. Suppose you know how to, or you or someone, suppose Microsoft puts out a product that, that claims to solve that problem. Well, then I'm going to hack their website with the following. Right? I, I, here's my program. My program is, uh, now you have to do a little trick. Right? There's, a, there's a, a nice exercise when you first uh, take a programming class, and the, the exercise is write a program which prints itself. Right? It's, it's, so, so you have to think about how to do that, but that, it's a nice exercise. Write down a program, and the only thing that the program, it, hold, it prints itself, and then it holds. Right? So it's, the program can write itself. It can refer to itself. Right? It is its own output. So you have to do a trick like that. So here's, but here's my program. My program is write, to, you know, take the, pro my pro the program for myself, and evaluate whether it halts. And if the Microsoft product says, you're going to halt, then don't halt. <laughs> Just spin the wheel for a while. And, that's, and if the Microsoft product says, ah, you're never going to halt, right? That's an, that's an Apple program, and it's not going to halt. <laughs> right? Then immediately halt. <laughs> right? so it, it's this, but it's the same thing, right? This sentence is false. This sentence is not provable. This program does not halt. Right? The program can refer to itself. The programming language is as rich. The language of C++ is as rich as this language. Right? If you make things concrete, does that program halt? OK, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's a concrete set. It's, it's in some, the halting problem is equivalent in, in, in a very uh, in a real way, it's computably isomorphic to uh, trying to figure out the existential theory of, of, the, of arithmetic. Do there exist no, um, does there exist a number that has a certain nice computable property? Because that's just like exact, asking does there exist a, a finite number is like asking whether there's, there's a, a proof or a computation or anything like that. Numbers can refer, numbers, I mean, as we all know, numbers in, written in binary can, ref, can represent all sorts of things. You have binary representations of photographs, binary representations of all kinds of stuff. You could have a binary representation of a program. Actually, there aren't like little letters floating around inside those computer boxes. That are, there are just numerical states. So the holding problem is really the existential uh, theory of arithmetic. Now, yeah, so I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the halting problem. When, it, when I first, right after I got my PhD, I spent, I was trying to think about that before the talk. I think I was spending 16 hours a day thinking about the halting problem and problems like it, you know, in that area. I was really working hard. And then uh, I did that for a long time, and then I got married. And then, I, then the proportion of time went down. Right? So I wasn't thinking about the halting problem quite as much. I probably only thought about it. Well, I would, 
think about it all day at work. And then when I had a chance at home, you know, I would think about it for maybe another hour or so. But I didn't think about it as much as I, as I did when I was single. And then, uh, then I have two children, and each time that I had another child, um, but the amount of time I spent thinking about the whole thing problem decreased. So, so now I'm down, I'm down to well under eight hours a day. But I, yeah, so yeah, actually though, I'm not, not every recursion theorist does that. I mean, some, some recursion theorists get married and they don't drop the amount of time that they think about the halting problem. <laughs> and I, I know one guy, in fact, uh, who, did, who got married, he did not reduce his halting problem time. And uh, I don't think he reduced his halting problem time until he was on his third wife. So, <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's interesting, but you know, don't go overboard with it. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a very interesting non-computable set. And actually, at the workshop this month, we've, we've heard a fair amount about, about the halting problem. And it has a nice connection now, which, is, which has come up. Which I'm learning a lot at this workshop because there's a nice connection between sets like this uh, and uh, randomness. Which, which surprised me that it's as rich a subject as, as it is, but it is. There's a lot of interesting work that I'm learning about there. Yeah, and actually, it's something, something new that came up during the workshop is that uh, there's, a, there's a computable probability measure such that that set that I wrote down is, is random relative to that probability measure. So it's got an interesting, it's an interesting connection. You know, so theorem from IMS and US. You know, this past week. Okay, so, so there's the holding problem. It's, it's a reasonably concrete problem. There are other versions, you know, sort of things that are of the same natural complexity as the halting problem, which are equally uh, unable to be computed. There's a, there's a really beautiful theorem due to Maria Savich, which says that, uh, well, I, I don't have much room over there anymore. Uh, so th suppose you wanted to answer the following algebraic question. And the question is, given a polynomial with integer coefficients, right, several variables, does it have an integer root? Okay. That's a nice concrete question. Of course, you know, you can have a, several variables could mean a lot, a lot of variables. It's, I know how to do it if the polynomial is a quadratic in one variable. Right, so there's, if you have ax squared plus bx plus c, there's an easy way to tell whether it has an integer root. Right, there is this formula, minus, plus or mi no, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Right? So you just check. You plug in the coefficients, you check whether what's under the radical is a perfect square, and there's your answer, you can tell. You know what the roots are. Okay, so the theorem, Adesavich's theorem, is that there isn't such a simple way to just tell whether a polynomial has an integer solution. Right? That's also a set that cannot be computed. And if you can't compute it, then there's no computable set of axioms which will let you always be able to prove whether it's true or false. Because if I, could, if I had a set of axioms which was complete for just vanishing of polynomials, right, then I could design a computation. Right? Just start looking through all the proofs until you get the answer. I mean, and that's sort of, in some sense, that kind of that's what I do every day, right? Is, is if I'm trying to solve some mathematical problem, I'm running through all the possible proofs that I can think of, hoping I'm gonna to get to an answer of either tr it's true or it's false, right? But if I had the wrong polynomial in hand, right, or the wrong program in hand, that method wouldn't work. Right? I'd spin my hourglass, you know, until I was dead. You know, I wouldn't get an answer, because there's no, it's possible that there's no proof either way. Right? And there's some concrete examples of, of situations where that can happen. Okay, so now, in fact, I think uh, it's actually, I find it much more interesting and, and more surprising uh, when somebody actually gives an algorithm to, to settle whether some mathematical, you know, when somebody actually shows that some complicated set can be computed, it's, that's the surprising accomplishment. There's so much that's not computable Right. That's uh, it's a big accomplishment to actually give an algorithm to show that something is is uh, decidable. 
Okay, now, so that's, so we have some examples of sets that, uh, you know, situations where proofs fall short of giving answers and sets that can't be computed. Uh, I want to point out and also uh, give a plug for a really nice, uh, interesting problem. So it's possible to turn this situation to your advantage and even turn it to your advantage in a very practical way. All right, so, so the theme here is that sometimes the means you have in hand are insufficient, in, provably insufficient, to accomplish some task. And so you can turn that, that to an advantage. Right, and what the place, the, the one natural place where it could be turned to an advantage is, suppose that you want to, hide, you want to keep some information secret. Right? And you, you don't want everybody to know how much money you have in the bank. And you, don't, you certainly don't want everybody to know the, your password so that they could transfer all your money into their account. Right? So you want, that, you, want some, like, you want that to be secret, right? how it is to get to your money. Right? You don't want everybody to know that it's in your mattress or, or that the password at your ATM is 1234, <laughs> which is, by the way, is not a good password. So, so th what you would really like is, of course, you want to get your own money, right? So you want a way to like, get in there yourself, but you want to make sure that anybody who doesn't know your password right, doesn't have the means to crack your account. Just like, you know, which is analogous to this, right? If you don't know the answer, you can't prove it. So there's a, there is this nice application of trying to find where the answer is provably separated from the question. How do I get into that person's bank account? And, and you want to know that nobody can get there using the resources that they have in hand, which might be an IBM laptop in three hours. And so it's. What you, so, so that question is, is, in practical terms, you want to have a secure encryption process. And so see, you know, some kind of nice keyed encryption process where if somebody wants to crack your account, they can't do it unless you know, it takes them all the number of, they need a computer the size of the universe and they need to compute for a billion years. You know? So that, you'd like something like that. That's an open problem. Oh yeah, oh darn, I forgot to mention. Well, okay, well, I guess I can. Maybe afterwards. So that's an open problem. Is, it, is there actually a really secure way to separate the, this piece of knowledge from the, the intruder without, you know, the intruder who doesn't have the key? Is there a way to, the intruder could be like listening to, to the transmission on the internet as you manipulate your bank account, but you wanna know that, that that is all completely inaccessible to the intruder, because the intruder doesn't, you know, the, the means that the intruder has, the tr intruder can't figure it out. And so there's a really nice problem on that, and uh, it has great practical significance. And there's a mathematical version, what's called the P versus NP problem, for which there's a million dollar prize. If you can show P doesn't equal NP, you can cash in for a million bucks. And uh, I see it as, as a logical problem in the same category as these problems. Here we're showing that that computation is not good enough to figure out the holding set, scale it down a little bit, and you want to know that computation in this amount of time is not enough to figure out that piece of, of information. It's in the same family of problems, though so, um, this one is solved in that, I mean, it's known this is not computable, that, that one it's not known. So you could, you could uh, transfer a lot of money into your bank account at the same time that you could uh, become a professor of computer science. Yeah, that's, it's an interesting problem. Even without those inducements, it's, it's an interesting problem. All right, so now, what, what do we make of this situation? You know, this, so there's, I gave some indication of how the method of provability, right, the method of try, trying to sort of use reason to figure out the answer to the mathematical problem, there's some limits to that. Right? There's, it, it, can't, it doesn't always work in every setting. So what what do professional mathematicians do since, since we can't do much more than compute and, and try to think? You know, it's, what do we do with this situation? Right? Maybe the method of computation and the method of proof are insufficient to answer the questions in which we're interested. So what, what do we do? 
we could panic, right? <laughs> that would be one, that's one option. One option is panic. Figure, you know, this is not the subject for me, right? I, I, I got into it deeply enough to understand that, you know, it's, it's a futile exercise. And I could make more money doing something else anyway, so it's panic, right? Run, right? Run from the subject. I mean, people do run from math, but it's, this is not the reason that they run from math. Right? Most mathematicians, they see this and they think, this is some kind of weird worst case analysis. Right? Like there are various kinds of algorithms that converge. Every time you, every time you, you try to use the, the METs, you know, some, some numerical method, every time you try to use it on the problem that is natural and came up you know, in an application, it converges nicely in you know, linear time or quadratic time. Even though you know the worst case analysis is it's exponential time and it'll never, you know, you're never gonna get the answer to that. But those are perverse you know, the examples. These worst case analysis of really robust algorithms is worst case. Right? And you just keep your spirits up. Right? I don't have to panic. Right? This is often some, this is a worst case analysis of the method of proof. The method of proof works perfectly well. We got a whole library full of math books. Theorems are being proven every day. People are collecting a million dollars solving problems in topology. Right? It's, this is a very successful enterprise. Right? Quantitative thinking has given us all kinds of stuff. Right? I know I can get up to IMS. I'm not going to end up at MSRI. Right? I know that all sorts of other good things are going to happen. I'm going to be able to balance my checkbook. Right? And it's not going to happen that I think I have $10. Or no, let's do it the other way. Because you might want it to happen that you think you have $10 and you actually have $10 million. It's not going to happen that you balance your checkbook and think, oh, wow, I have $100 million. Right? And it's, you know, if, if you, if you balance your checkbook and you think you have $100 million, you ought to go back and check the addition because you made a mistake. It's not because the rules of arithmetic are wrong. Right? It's, they are sound rules and you didn't do it right. right? So it's, you, you just keep your spirits up. Mathematics is extremely successful. This is a kind of off on the side you know, uh, matter. That, that's, that's how everybody thinks. Okay, so yeah, you have to have a matter of optimism and trust. Trust that the enterprise is robust and optimism you're not going to run into one of these nasty, in one of these nasty little cycles. Okay, so how about that? Does, is it, does uh, trust and optimism do it? Well, more or less. Yeah, more or less it does. It's, it's extremely successful. Not that many people run into this kind of incompleteness in provability. But occasionally, occasionally you do. Right, so I wanted to just mention uh, some interesting places where it can happen. Right? And then I want to sort of, in the last few minutes, uh, point out what I think is, in some sense, the most interesting aspect of, of this investigation. So what is it that can happen? So you can be, so let's start off with very concrete things. You're working in some area which involves just some kind of finite combinatorics. Right? So it could be that, that you're working in, there's no infinite, I'm not getting, pulling in any infinite sets, I'm not doing analysis, I'm just doing something with, with uh, the natural numbers and, uh, or maybe uh, little finite configurations of a certain sort, partitions of finite sets into pieces, that kind of stuff. So one thing that can happen is that um, you're working with these finite sets, and you, you know various principles about how, how these things work. Right? Uh, you can do proofs by induction. Right? So, and you, know, so you, and, you know, you can be pretty successful with that. Now, it can happen that, well, one, one thing that can happen, how, is it, how do people make breakthroughs? Somebody, some quirky genius, right? Everybody's working on this problem. It seems really hard. Nobody can get it. People don't think, oh, my goodness, we just hit logical incompleteness. Right? No, they don't think that. They wait for some quirky genius, some, somebody who, who thinks in a different way or, or is, is unbelievably 
powerful in technical ability, and that that person is able to do something more complicated than anybody could keep in mind before. And they just put together this, this terrific combinatorial argument to solve the problem. And then people are you know, awed, and they have to study it for five years, and, and then it becomes you know, simplified a bit, but it's, it's a breakthrough because somebody could handle a monstrous situation that nobody penetrated before. So that can happen. And it can happen necessarily so. It can happen that certain finite problems uh, involve deeper and deeper penetration into the way that sets fit together. For every set, for every set, for finite set of this sort, there is one of that sort. So that for every set like that, there's one like that. Who can, you know, the, ge the quirky genius can keep track of it deeper and deeper, right? And on. Uh, that's what makes you know, a good mathematician, somebody who's got a really complex mind that can handle sophisticated stuff. Okay, so, so it can also happen that that's necessarily so, that there's no proof using only simple combinatorics of this thing that can be proven using very complicated finite, finite combinatorics. And there's, so, so the, the group actually here, so there's been nice work by the group here, C.T. C. Chong and Yang Ri have done some really pretty calculations of that sort to show that you must go deeper and deeper into, into principles of number theory in order to prove, prove more and more complicated theorems. So sometimes you have to use more information about the sets that you're working with in order to resolve questions as to how they behave. So that's one thing that can happen. The second thing that can happen, and this ha can happen at different levels, but it can happen that let's still say you're trying to work on something finite, it can happen that you can't settle the problem only thinking about finite sets. You can only settle the problem if you bring in the apparatus of infinite sets. So there's a beautiful, there's some, there's a, some remarkable examples which in the uh, interest of time I won't discuss further, but there's a particularly, if you ever you know, have, have the uh, an afternoon or two free. There's a really beautiful paper written by uh, Paris and Harrington in which they give a, a nice combinatorial, a statement of finite combinatorics which can't be proven using only the resources. And so you have to make this precise, but it can't be proven without bringing in the, the algebra of infinite sets. So it's, uh, it's, it's sort of worse than this situation. But, I mean, it's, it's a true statement, and there is a proof, but you have to, in some, some sense, you have to use analysis to prove this statement about number theory. And, and necessarily so. It's not just that it's a clever use of analysis to give a short proof in, in number theory. It's a, a statement that's true in number theory that cannot be proven without invoking the, the apparatus of infinite sense. So there's a nice example like that. There's, if you move up in type, if you move up from finite combinatorics to the real numbers, then uh, there's the same aspect of you know, more and more complicated statements about the real numbers need more and more complicated features of the real numbers in order to settle them. But there's also another, there's a, a terrific example due to Harvey Friedman of a very natural statement. So if you know what these things are about Borel sets, so a natural question about Borel sets, and it can't be resolved without invoking the existence and using it uh, of uncountably many iterates of the power set of the reals. So you can't prove it just thinking about the real numbers. You can't, you can't prove the sentence just thinking about functions from the reals to the reals or some function algebra over the reals or some algebra of function algebras. You have to do that uncountably many times. Not just infinitely many, but infinitely many and then infinitely many more, and infinitely, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, there's, that's a nice example of something that's perfectly uh, reasonable statement in, in analysis, but you have to bring the whole hierarchy of uncountably many iterates of the power set to, to actually resolve the problem. Right? So it, it can't be proven just using analysis. It can't be proven using the power set of the, of, of the reals, et cetera. And then, then the last thing I wanted to mention is that there are very interesting aspects of, there are the Borel sets, there's, there's something that's a bit stronger than the Borel sets called the projective sets. So you take, for the mathematicians, you take a Borel set and a continuous image and a complement of that and a continuous image and so forth. Those are the projective sets. 
So there are natural questions. Does every project, is every project, oh, so here's a nice one. Uh, one of the fundamental, I mentioned the fundamental properties of fundamental notions in mathematics, right? So I said, I claimed logic is one of them. But certainly size, the mathematical notion of size is a fundamental notion. And so you can ask whether every one of those sets is measurable. Can you, in a nice way, say this is the size of that set, this is the size of that set? Right? Are all those sets measurable? The answer to that question cannot be resolved using the full apparatus of set theory. It's independent over everything you've ever heard in any math course except for a logic course. Right? Cannot be used to resolve that question. Right? There is, it's, it's independent of everything you've ever heard of. Unless you've heard of what are called the large cardinals. And the large cardinals are, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's not the, just the power set or a couple power sets. It's the global property of the universe of sets. So, so the, the whole structure of the universe of sets, how does it all work? That can be brought to bear to resolve questions about measure for the projected sets. So there's, there's, uh, there's interesting examples all the way up, from finite to deeper facts about finite, from finite to infinite, from infinite to lots and lots of sets that you have to construct to analyze the situation, and finally to, to situations where you have to use really meta-mathematical considerations. How, what's, this, what's the nature of the universe of sets? It has reflections on these fairly concrete problems. So there's some, there are interesting examples where it comes up. And I think it, bearing on fundamental mathematical questions like questions of size and, and uh, so forth. OK, so I want to end with the following intriguing thought. Right? Well, I find it very intriguing. So the, here's the question. The examples that I, all, that I gave were all examples where I, they were examples of things where, to my mind, these were all math, true, you know, they were all mathematical problems that, that are, were naturally posed, and they could be resolved, right? But the, as I went up in, in, in the scope of those examples, what you had to use to resolve the problem became further and further, it was, I needed to know more and more of the mathematical world in order to resolve this fairly concrete problem. Right? But it, it was always more. Right? It, it wasn't like uh, there was a scale there. I said at first you had to know about deeper things about finite sets. Then you had to know about infinite sets. Then you had to know about deeper things about the continuum. Then you had to know about function algebras of function algebras, et cetera, et cetera. Then you had to know about all the sets. Right? So it got, every time that you needed more, every time that you, there was something you couldn't resolve, you went off and looked for a bigger context in which uh, you could pose the question and resolve it. Okay, so here's the question. Is there only one direction? I mean, so in this sort of sequence of mathematical apparatus, you know, each mathematical apparatus, that I plopped down, they just got bigger and bigger. I needed more and more sets, and, and I had to know how they were. So the question is, is it a one-dimensional family, the sort of meta-mathematical context in which you know, we know that they're all incomplete, but maybe as they get bigger and bigger, we get a complete theory of mathematics, a complete mathematical theory. Now, if, you're, if you want to have a complete mathematical theory, you're really trying to figure out what it is that's true. Right? Is, it, is there only one? dimension to that sequence, that mathematical hierarchy, right? So, or, you know, like, could there be different ways to go that, that uh, tell you different, different natural ways to go that you know, say that the mathematical universe is shaped differently? If incompleteness is really there, I mean, if we have to really confront incompleteness in the worst possible way, right, there would be believable, you know, passionately believable, mutually exclusive mathematical models of how the, the world works. Right? And there's, I don't, there's nothing that, that uh, rules that out. Things are all incomplete. They go either way. So why couldn't there be, like in politics, people who, intelligent people who don't believe the same thing? Right? But it, could it happen in mathematics? 
That's the question. And I, remarkably, you know, so, so remarkably the answer, well, but this is just by observation. It's a, it's a matter of, of just the way that things have been happening. The answer is no. There's just one linear hierarchy of, metamathematical hierarchy of principles. And people have had different candidates, but they've, they've always collapsed and been shown to be comparable. With, this one is more than that. So I, I want to end with, with uh, an interesting, you can see this at the very bottom with the halting problem. Here's an interesting fact. Uh, suppose that, that, so I mentioned, you know, the halting problem is a natural example of something that can't be computed. You know, sorry, I'm running over a couple minutes. This will be my last example, and then I'll stop. So the halting problem is, is a canonical, canonical way. Look at the halting problem. You get a canonical way to go from one set to another set which is not computable from it. Right? So if I know x, the halting, which programs which can refer to x halt, that's a set that x can't compute. Okay. Now, is it possible to give another completely different example, a completely different way to go off in the non-computable? And there's, a, there's an interesting theorem that's, that bears on that. So here's the theorem. Suppose that uh, I have any method at all, but let me restrict it to something that, that I can handle, like a Borel function. Suppose I have a Borel function, which maps me from x to something more complicated than x. Okay, so it's like the halting problem. Right? x goes to something that x, x, f of x is something x can't compute. And suppose that it's a canonical way to do things so that if, if, if y can compute x, then the thing that you produce relative to x is computable from the thing you produce relative to y. Okay, so it's an order preserving, in terms of relative computation, Borel function that takes you from a set to something above it that that given set can't compute. If you had two different ways, two different models of how to, how to decide the mathematical, mathematical truth, you might have two different models to produce sets, neither one computable from each other. And the theorem is, for any such function, those two, for any, any such function, that function is eventually above the halting problem. There is a set, there is, for all sufficiently large reals, the value of the function computes the halting problem relative to that function. And this phenomena, you, there's a general, there's a natural, general, natural generalizations for, that go quite up, quite high up in, into the definable hierarchy. And it suggests to me that, that uh, even, though there's in, even though there's a lot of chaos and incompleteness, there's order there too. And it uh, keeps me optimistic that the mathematical enterprise is not going to yeah, get me f to MSRI when I want to go to IMS. All right, so thanks, thanks for your attention, and uh, I'll end with that. It's, yes, when, when I say it's not computable, I, I mean not computable in the, in the and I can make that very precise. I, I can just say it's not computable by any program written in C++. Yeah. Yeah. Not computable by any program, even on a, on a machine that has infinite memory and infinite storage. Well, let's see. So it's my it's my personal view that any 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 two any language that's rich enough right, can simulate any program written in any other language. So that's Church's thesis. So to me, you know, so I'm sort of accepting Church's thesis as true. So when I use computable, I, I don't really specify it. But yeah, so as a philosophical point, uh, if you want to be mathematically precise, you have to fix the language in which which you mean the computation to be written. But it seems fairly credible to me that at least for the model in which you're computing by calculation rather than computing by using some physical process, right? That, that uh, Church's thesis is true. So you are accepting that maybe it's computable by some physical 
Yeah, I can't rule that out. I mean, you never know. Right? I mean, it's uh, there seems to be something unpredictable about nature. So it wouldn't surprise me to have to build a device which which uh, could produce output in in a reproducible way that's not compute that Bill Gates couldn't compute. Yeah, so that's an interesting problem. I mean, so it, it's, uh, well, look, let's see. So let me give a couple of examples. So the first one is, uh, OK, so yeah, let's see. Well, I guess there's the one that I always bring up for my father. Right? You have a bunch of. Uh, Actually, he's the, one, he's the one who brings it up to me. So you have a bunch of uh, ping pong balls, and they have numbers on them, right? And they're bouncing around. Right? And you know, I don't think quantum effects have much to do with, with that situation, you know, per se. So they're bouncing around inside some cube. And then you, know, you open up the stopper at the top, and one of those balls comes up. Right? Is, there a, is it possible to write down even a program, I mean, so it's, if we just talk about classical physics, right, the, the initial state, and it determines it at every later state, right, it's, but uh, I'd be hard put to write down a program which could compute what that number is before the number comes up. And actually, I don't think that there is one. I, I think that's as complicated, that, that it's as, you run the experiment, and that's the fastest process that will get to it. But I can't prove that. I think that's an interesting problem. Uh, so that's that's one. So that, that's sort of a physical, physical one. Uh, so I think that there are things that happen physically that where you can't improve on the physics in terms of predicting what's going to happen. Right? And so that's. So my father doesn't believe that. And so, so that's one. The second one is is people have given examples where. Uh, well, you, you can take sort of initial conditions on PDEs. And it, all, the initial condition, the boundary conditions are all computable, but the solution is not computable. And the solution exists, but it can't be computed. So, there, there are, so to the extent that you think that PDEs, you know, sort of natural PDEs, uh, have physical analogs, there's, there's also that kind of, that kind of situation. Uh, that, that example seems less satisfying to me, yeah, but, um, but it's there. Yeah, so the, the uh, I guess what, what's, there was this, this question about logic, right? was uh, sort of a, an obsession at the time of the, the beginning of the 1900s. Right? What's the right notion of logic? And now you have to be, so that's depending on you know, how much of the scope of truth you want to capture, right? Uh, logic has to get richer and richer. Okay, so th the easiest thing for me as a mathematician is to limit the scope until I can make perfect sense of it. Right? And so uh, there is, the f if you just look at mathematical structures, right? so mathematical structure consists of, so, uh, of you know, like uh, to take an example, arithmetic. So there's the numbers. And there's the operations of plus and times. Zero, one, you know, a couple special numbers for which we have special names. OK, so, so now if you're only talking about a structure that looks like that, 
It has a plus, it has a times, it has a zero and a one. And it obeys certain addition commutes or you know, A plus B equals B plus A. So you, you specify what properties you want to uh, hold in this, you know, the properties that you're taking is known about the structure. Okay, then the, the right identification of logic would be to say, uh, let's identify exactly some or, or any or all ways to go from those principles that you've taken as given, to go from the givens, to state to sentences about plus times and so forth, which are true whenever those givens are true. Okay, so you want to say, I want to know that whenever these things are true, this is true. Now, a, a complete logic right, would be one that exactly duplicates that implication. Whenever those given things are true, you can prove the conclusion. Okay. So that was an earlier theorem of Gödel that was to identify, well, there were various people who contributed to it, but he finally proved the theorem that said, this is complete, right? That the, this logic, and he had one in particular in mind, but there's lots of ways to represent it, will actually give you exactly the collection of all consequences of those givens. So for, in a certain mathematical context, the problem is solved. Right? It's, there's, there is a way to duplicate s semantic implication. Whenever this is true, that's true. You can duplicate that using logic, which is whenever you're given this, you can prove that. Okay, so, so the, a correct and complete logic was, was exhibited, and that was early work of Gödel to prove the completeness there. Now, so what... Uh, so the, the logic is complete in that sense, in that it exactly characterizes semantic implication. Whenever this is true, that's true. That's exactly duplicated by provability. But, the, but truth is actually more subtle, because what the incompleteness theorem says is that you can't figure out what you want to take as given if you want to get all the truths. Right? There's no way to, to figure out what you should start with. There's no computable way to figure out what you should start with to generate all the truths. So the implication has been ca caught perfectly. But what should I take as given? Right? Can't be caught. That's the theorem. There's no com way to compute what you should start with in order to get all and only truths. So the logic is, at least in that context, for, for those kinds of mathematical situations, the logic is, is perfectly known. But uh, you just don't know where to start. You got a good car, but you can't, you know, you don't know where to start in order to get to certain destinations. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's various ways to, to come at it. You can, there's another way, again, in this exact same context, mathematical context, there's another way to, I mean, if, if you replace uh, this kind of sequential proof just by, I know, any way to, to go from the givens, any way to compute from the givens, the, the consequence, right? So there's a, there's a way to go which just involves uh, I can, pro I can prove that some statement is true if every attempt to build a counterexample runs into trouble. And there's, so there's some finite point at which you can see it's not possible to build up a structure which exhibits that the sentence is false. So there's a method to go at it that way. So it's, it doesn't have to do with, with you know, sort of the, the use of language. Right? It's a computational method to just try to build the model in which the sentence fails. Try to build up a structure in which the sentence is false. And then, if the sentence is provable, that attempt to build the refutation has to die out. And you see that at some finite point. Right? And if the sentence is actually not provable, well, then you go on forever and asymptotically 
the process constructs a counterexample model where the sentence fails. So again, provable is finite, but it's a completely different kind of finite object. Yes, yeah, so it's more, more semantic than, than this kind of reason step by step. And it's kind of interesting that the two, those two, what seem like really different approaches coincide to exactly the same notion. And I think it's remarkable that, that there's a notion of logic, the sequential logic, that captures semantic uh, implication. I think it's, it's magnificent. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what I do. I can tell you personally what I do. I wait. I wait until I can't stand it anymore. And 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 I'll tell you a real a dirty secret about myself. If if the if I see that little hourglass going, but I can still play a game of free cell. <laughs> I play a quick game or two of free cell, and if it hasn't stopped by then, then then I do control alt delete, and then if it doesn't stop, I have to restrain myself, and I very gently hold down the power switch. <laughs> And if that doesn't work, it depends if I'm using a laptop. If I'm using a laptop computer, I pull the battery out. <laughs> sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, uh, for this thing, will be around uh, for, two for next weeks. week. Yeah, two weeks. So you can be contacted uh, either at the Institute for Mathematical Sciences or in the Department of Mathematics. So you're welcome to, to talk to him. I'm sure you're happy, as you know, he likes to talk on this topic. <laughs> So uh, that is our uh, thank Professor Simon for the Thanks. wonderful talk. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.